high street as an elemental place of cultural vitality, of heritage, and also of uprising and resistance, as well as a place of transaction and work, provides an incredibly valuable space to think about urban multicultures and the diverse formations of what it means to claim space, but also to hold on to space. So in our panel today, we're going to be talking about ethnically diverse high streets across the UK and the very different kinds of challenges that come from being in varied cities and towns. But we're also going to think through and with a city like London and the ongoing crises of displacement that has very much unsettled the everyday possibilities of our high streets as much as, as who is imagined as being included in shaping their cultures and their futures. I'd like to just very briefly make reference to our recently published Runnymede Trust report, which came out this week, called Revisit Revisiting Brick Lane, the impact of COVID-19 on an ethnically diverse high street. This project has very much been led by Claire Alexander and has been co-authored with Sean Carey, Julia King and myself. So in this report, we signal the compounding struggles experienced by those working in food and hospitality sectors nationally, um, as well as the significant representation of South Asian groups in food retail and in self-employment, with very distinctive implications for the Bangladeshi restaurant and curry trade on Brick Lane. So for example, we discovered that in 2014, there were around 35 restaurants and today only 18 remain. We also want to reflect in this report on questions of who falls through the gaps of state compensation and furlough schemes, but also how do we think about the emergence of, of step-in and online services and the exorbitant rates that are often associated with participating in these platforms. So let me start our discussion then with a, a brief introduction to our panelists. Um, we were expecting three panelists at the moment. We have two. Hopefully, Dr. Fatima Regina will join us shortly. But I'd like to begin with Mondo Ram because I think he is he is the king of thinkers in this field. He's the director of the Center for Research in Ethnic Minority Entrepreneurship. But he's also one of the leading authorities on ethnic minority entrepreneurship research. And he's really active in supporting and advising local interest groups, as well as trying to think about how to speak to government on the importance and value of ethnic, of ethnic minority businesses. And I'm also delighted that we have Saif Osmani, who's an artist, an architectural designer and an activist. And he's also co-founder of the Bengali East End Heritage Society. Saif and others set the society up in 2016, not only to consult with local people, um, but also to really voice opinions on changes taking place in the built environment and to think much more carefully and in considered ways about the unjust impacts on the British Bangladeshi community in East London. I'm, I'm really so pleased to welcome you um, in, in this discussion today. So the way we're going to organize our discussion is I'm going to ask um, a set of questions, I'm going to allow both Manda and Saif time to consider and respond. And then we're going to bring in perspectives from the floor. I know I know we've got a lot and an active and interested audience, so it's going to be really valuable to hear from you as well. So Manda, if I can begin with you. Um, I wonder if you can begin to say for us how you describe the very particular social and economic resource of the high street, you know, not simply as a, as a place of economic transaction, mm -hmm. but, uh, but as a place of, of different kinds of economies which invoke care, counsel, etc. And as part of that question, how are our groups that are marginalized and minoritized core to understanding this resource? Thanks, uh, Susie. Um, look, it's a really important question. The first one um, relating to how we actually view um, these entities we call an ethnic minority business or a, a high street or a corner shop, etc. 
you've written uh, really powerfully um, on this topic in your recent book, Migrant Paradox. We've been sort of following the uh, high street in our work on and off for some two or three decades, looking at particular sectors like the catering sector, curry houses, retailers, um, uh, clothing shops, etc. Focusing particularly uh, in Birmingham and throughout and in Leicester. Um, and throughout that time, a number of things have become very apparent. I mean, you, you raised the question about um, how they can be seen in a broader context, the social as well as the economic. I'll talk about that, but I don't think we should understate the economic. Yeah. Um, I think it's really, really important to restate that quite powerfully um, for a couple of reasons. You know, one, it's underplayed, just academically it's underplayed. You know, we, we often write off these businesses as low value added businesses, you know, which presupposes that we know what value means. Um, and, uh, and I think you, you, in your own work, in a very pragmatic way, you grossed up the contribution of various streets and it outweighed lots of conventional shopping centres where most of the resources go. So the economic point is worth restating. And it's worth restating that these are the kinds of businesses that will recruit local labour, that will provide vital local services, that provide a route way, a pathway to social mobility for excluded communities. So just on its own terms, the pure economics, it has a value that is massively understated, in my view. But the second point, I mean, this is even more of a, a travesty, really, that we don't recognise the entirety of the contribution that um, local shops make, the high street makes. We were talking earlier about, you know, tomorrow morning, on, uh, as part of my work with the North Civil Society Alliance for Citizens UK, I'm going to visit a local um, gym owner in Hansler. Um, and uh, throughout this month, the Black History Month, we're going to local shops uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're having webinars on the stories of local businesses, largely with a view to highlighting their crucial role in sustaining local communities. As uh, I think we've both written about that these, these businesses, they are a vital social hook. You go to these businesses if you want to know where the best jobs are. Local jobs are how to get an appointment with the doctor, to circulate, to barter, to, to negotiate, to receive and to provide um, care, basically to function as a, as a citizen and, um, and to make your way in a community and in wider society. Because the kind of networks that I suppose lots of all communities take for granted, lots of businesses take for granted, they simply do, uh, they simply break down when you're talking about local high streets. So we're going to, I'm sure you know, we're going to move on to the impact of COVID, but it, the formal mechanisms of the state that support businesses, chambers of commerce, growth hubs, local enterprise partnerships, planning departments, they have no uh, pathway to these businesses. They are not connected to these businesses. Um, they, may as, they may as well not exist for the purposes of those businesses. And when you take into account the policy context, there's a lot of rhetoric about leveling up, about um, inclusive uh, growth. And um, you know, there is no connection between th that rhetoric and the value of these businesses potentially realizing those objectives. Um, so I think a, a key point is that we really need to have a, a granular lived experience, organic view of how these businesses actually function in the economy. And then if we if we were to have that more complete picture, we wouldn't write them off as just corner shops. We wouldn't write them off as marginal uh, actors. They might be marginal in in policy terms, but in the in terms of the functioning of local communities, they're pretty central. And uh, I mean I can go on by the but do you want me to do your second part of the question? So one thing I do want to push you on there, Monda, yeah. is um, I think many of us for a long time have been involved in the work of stating the value of the high street yeah. Yeah. Um, to various sectors of the state. And for whatever reason, 
it's not necessarily being received or it's being yeah. re received in sort of very polite but ineffective terms and so i wondered if you could push a little bit more for us this idea of of a different kind of vocabulary um and who speaks who does the speaking and yeah. how do they do the speaking um I mean, this is a question of power and representation. Yeah. Well, it's a question of power, and it starts even before anyone speaks. It, it's, I think it starts when people set the rules. So, for example, um, many of the regeneration, many many of the business support initiatives are targeted at small firms, come through um, pots and funding pathways that explicitly exclude these kinds of firms. So, European funding excludes retailers, excludes businesses of a particular size. If you want the government's flagship initiatives to help small firms at the moment is called Help to Grow. It excludes firms with fewer than five workers. That is wow. virtually 90%, more, actually more than 95% of the small business community. And that's even on terms of disproportionately smaller. Right. So you have already structural exclusion. Right. Before anyone speaks. Then let's see, then let's move on to who speaks. Well, the formal institutes are the chambers of commerce, which in many cases are, are, are interested in recruiting members, not serving communities. Um, and then you have policy actors, policy institutions, which prioritize certain sectors. So yeah, we had an, in, which we don't have now, but we had an industrial strategy that didn't include retailers. That didn't include many of the sectors that minorities operate. So, if you've got all policy leaders and policy actors um, ex excluding in their remit minority businesses, you know, all the odds are stacked against you. And so, you know, in terms of, so it is a question of power, but um, most of, even before anyone speaks, the rules of the game are stacked against many of these. Uh, businesses and then there's a question of well who speaks for these high streets now it's really interesting that you've got some new in, well, relatively new innovations called business improvement districts right but who dominates those business improvement districts it's not corner shops yeah right so in the area that i'm working in now um sort of Lozells and stratford road borsley green there is no bid there Bids are reasonably effective um, actors, but there is a bid in Colmore Road, which is the, which is flooded with lawyers. Um, and there's a bid, a bid in the nighttime economy place, but they in Birmingham Broad Street, but there's no bid in Los Angeles, right? And because of the lack of resource, lack of mobilisation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. The question of who speaks is really, really interesting, and it's left now to non-formal business actors to, to I suppose, make up for that, uh, to fill that void. So, as I said, we're working with Citizens UK, and they're increasingly stepping into that space. You've got community groups sp stepping into that spa uh, space, and you've got informal networks. Now, they are the the de facto ecosystem of business support now for for high streets, not the formally resourced a actors. So I think, and that I think is becoming increasingly apparent. And that that came particularly to the fore during the pandemic. During the pandemic, when the government were in the in the, in the teeth of the pandemic, when the government were um, pushing out resources, pushing out money. With, how do they convey their resources? Well, through the formal institutions. But we were working with uh, businesses who were suffering acute, uh, ac acutely, and they weren't receiving any of the grants and loans. They hadn't heard of them, so they couldn't navigate the process. And it was only because Citizens UK stepped in that it, it, the businesses that we worked in got the grants, got them what they were entitled to. And that's, I really highlighted the breakdown of government uh, of communication with uh, the high street and communication with local businesses. Thank you so much, Manda. I mean, partly also what you're saying is there is a um, a kind of 
a de facto system of support that is able to exist and particularly in places where you're working in Birmingham and Leicester, some of that has to do with being able to accept and retain um, affordable space. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know um, th there, there, are, there are places explicitly in London, places where Sahif has worked, um, where that sense of affordability is being, is being radically eroded. Mm -hmm. And and so the resource of the high street uh, is being altered as a result. So, so if I wonder if you could come in and add to your responses to that initial question. Sure. Um, I think the high street, um, as we know it, um, isn't necessarily always a high street. You know, it's actually much more of a mixed place. Um, this kind of top down model of just looking at as this linear retail thing. Um, that we all kind of experience um, where we want to buy, update our jumpers or whatever it is, um, it's, is really, um, it, it's beyond that. And I mean, I've, I've always been brought up around ethnic minority space. I was born just off of Brick Lane, um, where the big Save Brick Lane campaign is actually taking place um, um, on Woodseer Street, um, where there's a new shopping mall coming in um, or has been approved by Tower Hamlets Council. And that would bring in a very high-end um, shopping experience, which doesn't necessarily um, include people longer term and local people. And what Mondo very, very um, describes very well, which is actually that a lot of South Asian or um, um, ethnic minority businesses in particular are operating on what is now called a micro business level, and that's one to five people. And people don't really know that because obviously, when you say micro business, it sounds like um, like everything's in miniature all of a sudden, <laughs> you don't actually know what these terms are. And these wordings and these terms are really, really crucial. So the impact of what's happening on, for example, on Brick Lane uh, with the Woodseer Street campaign, uh, I mean, Woodseer Street um, shopping mall, is that the affordability of um, of the um, of the restaurants and the smaller businesses, which are really, really crucial to the ecosystem, which is essentially what a high street is, um, is going to be largely affected because essentially the neoliberal idea that somehow the high street is this similar experience and we can all be equal because we can all have somehow glass frontages and um, we almost all desire the same thing um, is is not true. You know, if you look at high street that I've just come from, um, from Green Street in Upton Park in neighbouring Newham, um, I was just showing to um, German filmmakers around who want to talk about um, larger tectonics like housing markets and so forth and their impacts on these high streets um, and um, for, for me what you find is that the um, the community have have and have to define their own shopping experience their own retail their own high streets in their own ways and they have done in areas like green street the reason they're extremely popular um, with south asians across the country is because they're very successful and they cater to uh, you know to cater to a very large section of our society which relies on that style of shopping and has become a cultural center as well it's part of our heritage our heritage isn't sitting in museums locked up to be um uh, to be looked at by somebody somewhere in the future it's actually a lived heritage it's something that is continuous it's continuously changing um and it's and that is part of the beauty of it i mean i'm I come from um, a Bangladeshi background, my parents are from Silet, and that's very nuanced as well compared to other parts of Bangladesh. Now, the high street can do that. It can actually absorb in quite a lot of all of those aspects of what it means to be an ethnic minority in London and to have that dual identity. So affordability is, like if we come back to that, is really, really crucial to allow for people to have that leg up into society as a whole and to have larger civic engagement really and what you're finding is that the structures that are existing such as the planning department um, the planning system in the UK is often um, is often pushed by um, you know a particular section of our society which is often not directly embedded in, within that community as well um, is often making decisions about a community which all sounds great on paper but in actuality the impacts are devastating um, what we found for example um, in upton park in queen's market is that during the um the time of covid 
it became even more important to have Queen's Market there because the affordability of cheap, affordable food and clothes was really, really important for people who come from South Asian and Black and Afro-Caribbean backgrounds and ethnic minority backgrounds because we were having food banks on the other end of Green Street. Mm -hmm. Now, if that market wasn't there and if it didn't have the interrelation with the high street and um, and all of it, we'd be relying on a high street of shutter shops. You know, some of the closed shops were able to turn overnight into food stalls and it, it became even more important. So essentially, we have to admit that in London, there's some sections of our society which do live on five pounds a week. And that's something that we still have to keep in mind that just because, you know, uh, people want to have a beautifully um, curated burger, um, we have to also consider that the person tossing that burger might be coming from a different background and they might not be from your background and they might not desire the same things. And I think they're innate things that we have to just question ourselves as human beings, that can we create a city that is inclusive to all people, not just our own section of whatever it is, whether it's you know, a section of a middle class, in, international middle class who can afford to do that, or whether it's um, us being open and honest about what it is to be community um, and to have an inclusive space for everyone. Thank you, Saif, that's terrific. I'd like to welcome Dr. Fatima Regina, who's just joined us. Um, Fatima is a Legacy and Action Research Fellow at the Stephen Lawrence Research Centre at De Montfort University. And her work very much engages with British Bangladeshi Muslims and their changing identifications and perceptions of dress and language. Fatima, just to give you a sense of, of what we've been discussing, Monda's really been articulating for us the importance of restating the purpose and value of the economic uh, in terms of essentially thinking about places where people can make their way. And Saif has really added to that in, in articulating the high street as an ecosystem that sustains the possibilities of difference and of lively heritage um, and the kind of devastating impacts when those in, uh, ecosystems are either undervalued or dismissed. So it would be great to have you coming in there to, to give your understandings of, of how a high street is understood as a resource and particularly how um, this is a resource for marginalized and minoritized groups. Uh, first of all, apologies um, for being late. Uh, just having some issues with my with my internet at home. Um, uh, so thank you, thank you for for having me on this panel. Um, I think um, I mean I've been thinking about what high streets mean, and particularly so in my family right now, we've got a we've got a family wedding coming up, and uh, I'm, I I saw um, Saif mention Green Street. You know, I've had so many trips to Green Street because it partic it provides particular it meet uh, meets particular needs. Uh, there are particular demands from within the South Asian community, and that demand is met by, uh, you know, Bethnal Green Road has a few of those as well. Green Street, Whitechapel, uh, Brick Lane used to be that shop when I was a child. Brick Lane used to be the shop, uh, uh, the the lane actually, um, where people used to go to get their saris and their wedding. Uh, decor and you know all the different platters and, and everything so um and i think that's something uh, as part of our campaign the save brick lane campaign one of the aspects of the campaign was for us to go door knocking and collect um signatures from local residents and when we were door knocking and speaking to people residents and within the sort of vicinity e1 vicinity within uh, brick lane on the estates that was something that a lot of people were sort of um I wouldn't even say it was nostalgic. It was just people were just, you know, very much frustrated with the fact that this very lane that had, you know, met all their needs. Now they have to go outside of that to go and get their basic needs met. So, for example, there are still a few uh, fruit and veg shops. So you have the Zaman Brothers that are still there. You've got Tard stores. Um, they're still there. Um, I can't think of any other fruit and veg stores, for example. And, and and what's been frustrating as well, and a narrative we've picked up on this campaign, is the assumption that there are no longer Bang that the Bangladeshi community no longer lives around Brick Lane, which is completely untrue. Um, I mean, from all the door knocking we did across all the estates around Brick Lane, every other house was either you know um, occupied by a multi generational family, or it was occupied by, interestingly, in my case, the houses that I knocked on. Um, there were a lot of uh, Italian uh, Italian Bengalis who are renting from 
British Bengalis. Um, and and then uh, all the non-Bengali people who were living around the area were usually renting from their Bengali landlords or landladies. So um, so this idea that, the uh, you know, and, and every other family we spoke to, or I certainly spoke to, were, were Bengalis. So I think what we found is that this idea that because they're not there, so the invisibilize, invisibilizing of the community helps to create a sort of social space, which is what Brick Lane has become. It is this social experience for people, um, the social gathering of experiencing these, you know, very unique cafes where they make donuts that are, I don't know, you know, have some special ingredient and you pay six pounds for a donut, you know. Um, no exaggeration, you know, there are these shops on Brick Lane when you go to the North End in particular. And, um, and then in the, in the North End, there was this cafe, I don't know if you remember the name, Saif, um, that cafe where you wear jumpsuits, those orange prison jumpsuits that look like the Guantanamo Bay jumpsuits. You get to experience prison. Alcatraz. Sorry? Alcatraz, is it? Or... I can't remember the name right now, but they wear these orange jumpsuits um, and you get to experience prison um, and you pay £45. And that's just the entrance fee. And then God knows how much the drinks cost once you're in the jail or once you're in your jumpsuit and you go into these jails that are set up for you. And, um, and it's quite astounding because, you know, when we look at the poverty rates in Tower Hamlets, when we look at the community that lives there, one of the poorest in the country, and, and then you have that, you know, uh, you know, it's just, it's just quite astounding. And, and as part of this campaign, I think we've just realized how that lane has been transformed to accommodate the needs of, of people who don't even live there. Uh, it's for people to have a particular social experience and, and, and be able to take you know, nice shots and say, you know, look, I've, I've experienced what it's like to be in, in prison for, for an hour uh, with my mojito or whatever it is they serve. Um, so I think, I think that's what's been quite frustrating, particularly on this campaign, seeing um, what Brick Lane meant to people. But um, I'm also conscious when I share this that people weren't talking about this in this sort of nostalgic, romanticized sense. It's, it's a part of their sort of livelihoods of like, okay, I live here and I want to be able to access my fruit and veg down the road, I want to be able to buy, if my sari's ripped, I want to be able to access tailors on Brick Lane. I, don't, I shouldn't have to go to Green Street to find tailors to fix my blouses or whatever. So I think um, this sort of, uh, the invisibilizing of the Bangladeshi community has enabled for Brick Lane to become um, aesthetically, um, it's quirky that you get to see the, these gates, uh, because when you enter Brick Lane, there's a huge gate that's supposed to represent um, the gates that you use in Bangladesh or at Bangladeshi weddings um, and then you have the lampposts which are painted in green and red again to sort of um, uh, it's, it's to sort of uh, resemble the colors of the uh, Bangladeshi flag so the aesthetics of it is there but the people people don't want to see the people um, people don't want to see the Bengali people who literally fought on this lane uh, you know just uh, 40 years ago um, who had to lay their bodies at the end of uh, Brick Lane the North End to fight off, uh, you know, the National Front from selling their um, their pamphlets, their leaflets. Um, so I think I think high streets for particular communities, um, and I think it's very much classed, uh, you know, high streets. Uh, I, I'm born and raised in in Luton, and um, and seeing the drastic changes in in the high street in Luton, um, because for example, Marks and Spencers just couldn't keep up anymore in Luton, and they had to close. And that's to do with the socioeconomics of the community, which is mostly made up of, again, very um, uh, working class uh, white and Asian communities who can't afford to buy 50 pound jumpers for Marks and Spencers, you know. Um, so and Marks and Spencers is seen as one of your sort of standard, if you want to say shop on a high street. But Marks and Spencers couldn't survive in Luton because people don't have that kind of disposable income yeah. so I think you know class class uh, you know as well as race are the two key sort of variables in trying to understand and how um, you know the high street is being shaped and reshaped and who is able to access those shops and who isn't and Brick Lane in this instance is definitely no longer accessible to uh, the Bangladeshi community who can't afford to pay you know six pounds for a donut you know but when that money is probably used for their weekly child's you know um, lunch money Thank you so much. I mean, you raise really um, incredibly emotive responses there. And I think amongst many crucial things that you said, we need to think adjacently with this ethnically diverse resource to a resource that's also multi-generational. 
you know the fact that brick lane has a primary school and that people collect kids at the school gate at 3 30 and that older people are going on to mosque and this place that extends beyond a hipster imaginary of someone who's aged between ages sort of 25 and 35 and has disposable income um is is a, again a, another feature that we just don't put seriously enough on on the agenda of concern I would like to raise also just one other aspect that has come out very much from my research on various streets across the UK, and that is the high street as a resource to make work, mm. particularly for people who've been discarded from other ways of making work. So, you know, when we look at high streets, for instance, in Birmingham, Leicester, Manchester, Bristol, uh, people who are working in those shops, either as proprietors or employees, um, Really interestingly, the vast majority of them were never traders in the first place. They became traders by virtue of processes of redundancy um, and dramatic shifts in employment patterns. And as we're moving towards this really damaging economy where more and more people will be casualized, more and more people will be self-employed, and that brunt will be, will be borne by racialized minorities, how do we begin to think about affordable and physical places in which people can conduct their work? Um, and I think that question of affordability, precisely as you say, Sahif, is one attached to um, our, our, the very nature of our existence. It's cultural, it's economic, um, it's social. Yeah. I'd like to move on to our next key question which many of you have in part touched on because we can't think about the resource of the high street without thinking as well about some of the threats. But can we talk more explicitly about um, the ongoing, but um, as well as immediate threats that that you are seeing around you on, on the high street and, and more particularly what the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has been um, on high streets that you are familiar with. So, um, Fatima, I'd like to start with you on this one, please. Thank you. Um, the impact of COVID, I mean, I think um, it goes uh, without saying, um, if we look at the reports on COVID and the communities it's impacted, um, the Bengali community was one of the um, harshly impacted community. And if we look at reports of East London and the struggles of um, particularly the Peace Gardens, um, which is a uh, cemetery where mostly Muslims from around London bury their relatives and, um, and, and, and the struggles they had in, in trying to keep up with the number of local deaths of uh, local Bangladeshi families. Um, so I think, I think COVID and its impact on the community, I mean, it's, 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 been, it's been incredibly harsh uh, because um, a lot of people, you know, um, who live around the area they still work in the takeaways and the restaurants um, and that industry was was massively impacted by covid and a lot of them just had to take on other jobs so one of the jobs that became um, quite prominent it seems um, is um, becoming sort of delivery drivers um, just eat um, and i think that's why um, if you look at iwgb uh, the union they are currently recruiting a Bengali speaker to organize uh, delivery drivers because during the pandemic you saw a, a sort of rapid increase in the number of young Bengali men in particular who signed up to become delivery uh, drivers. Um, so I think, I think the impact has been quite severe on the community in, in the way they've had to manage their sort of economics and then um, and that then impacts obviously the shops that they can visit, um, even the ones that they go to um, and there was, there was a debate within the community about how uh, Bangladeshi businesses were suddenly increasing prices of staple foods like rice, um, flour, particular vegetables that are, you know, uh, are part of um, certain dishes. Um, so there were a lot of internal debates I'm aware of uh, that were happening and how, uh, you know, because there were fewer flights coming in from Bangladesh um, with those uh, main uh, fruit and vegetables. So I think the impact is sort of trickled down from every aspect, whether economic, social, cultural, um, and just to the basics of being able to eat um, and have access to your, your sort of everyday fruit and veg that you can't access in Tesco and Sainsbury's. 
that you do uh, you can only access in sort of uh, specifically uh, some uh, some of those um, fruit and veg in Bengali shops only. So I think I think that that impact and then the, the the sort of again back to the affordability question of you know we're talking about a working class community suddenly having to pay two three pounds more to get you know uh, you know. If I'm very honest, I don't even know what half these vegetables are called in English. So, you know, to, to buy them, um, you know, you have to pay an additional two, three pounds. And if we're talking about households or multi-generational households, it means a curry needs to be a bigger portion, which means there needs to be more of the fruit and veg, which means you're spending more. And so I think I think the affordability and the community having um, directly being impacted with not being able to afford the basic meals, their staple food, I think was something that I was definitely familiar with. And I know in Town Hamlets, um, particularly Limehouse project in um, uh, East London in Tower Hamlets, um, they took uh, the responsibility and they got funding to basically start an alternative sort of, uh, I I'm not sure you can call it a food bank, but they were distributing food, hot food to people. And a lot of that food was being distributed to the estates around Brick Lane. Um, so again, if we look at the correlation between again, poverty and who was relying on you know, these sort of services that had to be made impromptu, made available to this community. So a lot of, again, uh, local uh, men and women uh, that I know were delivering these foods. Um, so they were delivering them, you know, uh, hot, hot rice uh, with some of the basic, um, basic dishes that they could pack up in little Tupperwares. Uh, so I think, um, you know, um, yeah, again, it goes back to class affordability and um, just how much the community ended up relying on um, these alternative food banks, because uh, because I remember I was speaking to someone in Tower Hamlets and they said to me, you know, we had to it had to be a group of Bengalis who are part of this alternative food bank because Bangladeshis don't eat pasta, for example. So you can't just give packs of pasta and tins of, you know, uh, you know, red kidney beans, for example, there had to be specific things. Um, and, and that's why, you know, they all came together and did that. So I think um, when these, with COVID, I think a lot of people realized, you know, you have to recognize the specificities of different communities. Um, and you can't just drop off packs of pastas and a bunch of tins of, you know, uh, red kidney beans, which was quite popular, spaghetti, um, tomato sauce, you know, you can't, it, it just doesn't work. And one, uh, initially, because that's what happened, and initially one elderly, uh, Bengali auntie said to one of the ladies that I know who was delivering the food, she just said to her, what do you expect me to do with this? Like, I don't eat pasta. Why am I going to boil pasta? You know, so I think, I think you know, uh, and this is just to showcase sort of just the sort of, um, you know, the harshness of the realities of a lot of the families that we knocked on their doors on, you know, uh, the, 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 their sort of experiences of COVID and the high street and just being able to access food. Thanks so much, Fatima. Manda, I'd like to come to you to think more of also about not only the specificity of certain communities, but the specificity of place. So we know at the peak of the pandemic that we saw about 90% drop in high street footfall, mm. but that this was really differentially occurring across space. So in a place like Brick Lane that has become deeply dependent on tourist economies and city workers mm. means mm. that that footfall drop is extreme. Yeah. But we also know that there's bread and butter streets in the heart of Leicester and Birmingham that mm. were really kind of providing an elemental role to the to the life blood of, of the communities. Well, yeah, I think that, that's a fascinating question, uh, Susie. And, and I think both processes are in play. You know, in a, in a, we're doing a piece of work at the moment. We're looking at this notion of productivity and micro, micro businesses and ethnic minority businesses. But two of the sectors we're looking at are sort of Bangladesh catering and retailing. And it was really fascinating. You know, the Bangladeshi catering sector, initially when COVID struck, it was a devastating impact, devastating impact, because um, largely, uh, people, uh, um, I mean, so the, what one phrase that became vogue and sort of makes me bristle is pivot, you know, as though it's a natural thing to do, pivot, change your business model. You know, the, the, the business model for a lot of um, Bangladeshi caterers, all the kind of businesses that we're interested in, has been entrenched for 20, 30 years. You know, uh, uh, Susie, you talked about you know, um, traders, they didn't have this sort of vocation to become a corner shop owner. It was forced on them because of lack of choice. When we did our very first study of the clothing sector in the late uh, 1980s, 
um, the, the the sort of clever, the shopkeeper that we interviewed, well, with with very few exceptions, they were there because they had no choice. They would often had qualifications, but they had no choice. It's still the case now, right? And so this business model of being um, uh, 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 competing in a particular segment of the retail trade, low, uh, low uh, ostensibly low skill, low price, hyper competitive, is still the case. And that's typically where a lot of the caterers, in, uh, Asian caterers, Bangladeshi caterers compete. And so when they say pivot, uh, have takeaways, etc. I mean, we, we worked with caterers who said, look, if, or if we went with Uber or Deliveroo, that's, you know, we have to give 20% of our profits away. They can't afford that. They can't afford that. Um, and so the, that sector, which was under a, a significant threat before the pandemic, before the pandemic, and now it's even much worse. And we don't talk about Brexit anymore, but that's exacerbated the situation as well. And so there's one, but then to your other point, Susie, about the, the retailers, that's still a sector we looked at. And you're right, uh, some of the retailers we interviewed did say, look, we're, we're finding people coming to our shop we've never seen before. Um, and that's because they have no choice and they're going to the, the local retailer. And, the, and those local, uh, brought communities together in that sense because they went to these uh, local retailers. These uh, individuals, these new customers didn't realize the kind of resources available in local retailers. And they were providing a real lifeline, but it was again, much more than the economic, it was the finding out, the refuge, et cetera. Um, and the, 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 I suppose the, 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 the camaraderie, the face, the inclusion, the place of mixing, the place of sort of uh, getting overcoming isolation, which it often is for uh, communities as well, and the place to get things done. You know, if you want help in your forms, you go there. And that came to the fore. Um, do, uh, has come to the fore uh, for during the pandemic. And, uh, and I think this question of, of affordability um, it, it is going to be even more pronounced there. It's one of the, the big issues I'm concerned about is, you know, it's always been my contention that the kind of businesses we're talking about have been erased from the policy discourse. But this, uh, this is intensified now because what is, what, what's the current sort of policy vogue in terms of rhetoric is well, well, we need to pay higher wages. Um, you know, just, the government has just rediscovered this as a, something desirable over the last month or so. And, um, and then they, they suck it up and say we've got to pay higher wages. And I'm just thinking, if anyone who knows anything about these businesses, well, that is a million miles away from the way they operate now. As you demonstrated, Susie, at the best of times, they operate in a context of precarity. At the best of times, and they develop a, a multitude of survival strategies, um, which are really agile, um, but which um, are you know, which defy formal classification. You know, people work in these businesses who are not formal employees. That's not nothing illegal about that. But there's people helping out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a very inter interdependent, reciprocal. Um, set of relationships. How does that fit within these new models that have suddenly been discovered for the way businesses should operate? You know, and so that really that really does worry me. That really does worry me because they, these businesses were uh, on the margins of you know, uh, surviving before the pandemic. The problems have been intensified and the sort of model of salvation is just a million miles away from where they are at the moment. And who's going to connect these businesses with that discourse? What, what, what is going to be the enabling inst policy institution that's going to encourage these firms to think maybe uh, differently about changing their ways of working? I can't see any. Manda, thank you so much. I do also want to raise the, the kind of fundamental question of mental health and well-being. Um, so when we were uh, down in, in Rookery Road in Birmingham in April, but also on Brick Lane before that, two of the proprietors, one of whom runs a travel agency, the other runs a curry house, both of them were saying that despite the fact that 
there were never going to be any customers in the periods of, of lockdown and afterwards, they came into work to sit on the chairs anyway, to try and retain an element of their mental health. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also really interested in the High Streets for All report that came out through the GLA that said, unlike other um, public spaces, people go to High Streets not as a destination in and of itself. There's an awful amount of people who simply go to hang about. Yeah. Um, and that hanging aboutness, um, again, is a is a quality uh, that planners don't seem to kind of consider. Um, so, say so if I wondered if you could come in a little bit about on questions of of mental health, of well being, um, and of the kind of innate cultural resource that that these ecosystems are. Absolutely. I mean, I think the um, I, I, when you look at a high street, I mean, it's actually quite different to what something like Brick Lane is, which is essentially a lane. And again, if if we take a top down model approach to it, um, it's kind of wrong to look at a lane as that. We might want to look at it as a high street, but it's actually not a high street. Um, it's a traditional lane. It's winding. It's awkward. And it's highly successful, you know, and it's highly successful because of the migrant communities which have gone through there. And now what you're finding is that there's developments like the um, Bishopsgate Goods Yard, which was approved in December 2020 by the mayor's office. And um, with that, what's coming over is a very high end retail experience um, with that notions of how we shop and this is how we shop and with it how we behave as well and i think all of those things um polarizes the community and creates segregation and what we're seeing at the northern end of um, brick lane is a much more um attraction of the hipster movement i mean nobody quite understands what the hipster is i think most academics would admit that as well and but they've got more traction they've got more traction from the ex existing embedded communities that are relying on that high high street or shop or lane or whatever it is um what we found during covid is that the um the shops along Brick Lane, the ones that people go to and were reliant on were the local shops. And there was a resilience from the curry house owners, which kept them there. In fact, when the um, when the cereal cafe, the hipster cereal cafe, which was notoriously firebombed, I think, or windows were broken by anarchists apparently a few years ago, um, um, when that closed, there wasn't a single article about it. So what does that say? That says that as soon as a curry house closes, oh, it's the end of the um, Bengalis and Brick Lane and all the rest of it. And yet the hipsters never get the same lens pushed towards them. And I think that needs to massively change. And that's really um, um, tied in with, um, again, a racialized, I mean, essentially racism, structural racism, which we saw um, during COVID on Green Street in Upton Park was that, um, that there were queues outside of the um, supermarkets um, and there, um, there were queues outside of supermarkets, but once you were in there, um, you weren't being policed as to how distant you were from the other person. And yet Queen's Market was not only had barriers around it, the entrances were blocked. Um, the locals were, you know, there wasn't even proper signage. The locals were treated badly. They were, weren't allowed in through one and out through the other. There wasn't enough um, alcoholic um, liquid in, in some of the dispensers, all the rest of it. And yet they were being blamed. Now, why is that? Why is it that we give certain sections of our society and retail experience and retail holders, often the much larger ones such as supermarkets, who get a huge amount of say in, in, in what happens on high streets, and yet their offer, in my view, is not very much. I mean, I don't shop at supermarkets as much as I shop at street markets because the food in street markets is better quality, it's ripe. There's more, there's more available there. And in fact, it links with other things like you're saying as culture and heritage and all of that. So there has been a huge different way in which, uh, different ways in which we have, um, you know, um, treated people during COVID. And we need to look at that, especially if we're looking at things through the lens of caring and and um, if you're looking at caring and how we care, you know, what's happened is a lot of our public infrastructure and politicians and and unfortunately, a lot of our politicians have turned into career politicians. Um, and what's happened there is that they're more concerned with siding with the larger financial, um, uh, the finance holders, as opposed to looking at who put them there in the first place. So the social value, the cultural value, and all of that, what we love that we can't always put our fingers on. 
um, is actually why we go to the high street. So for me, um, the high street as the two high streets that I go to, which um, appear to be slightly under threat um, or parts of them, uh, which is Brick Lane for inspiration and for cultural um, uh, encounter. That's what I go to Brick Lane for and to Queen's Market, where I go to eat, in fact, buy most of my food for three generations of our family from there. And we'll have to ask ourselves why are they under threat? And usually it's because land prices have suddenly gone up so high and it's speculative and the ethnic minorities are, have suddenly become uh, inconvenient to these developers and um, to the planning system or whatever it is that has made that decision. And I think the, two, the idea of mental health and well-being is interlinked to that. Um, if you're going and you're getting a lot of pressure and you're going about your normal life and you're being unduly pushed and pressurized at various things, it will have an impact on your mental health and well-being. And we need to tie those links together and join the dots because I know for a fact that, um, that for example, the money that's come in to Queen's Market and Green Street, for example, the 3.8 million that's come from the Good Growth Fund from the GLA and from Sadiq Khan's office um, has not properly consulted Black and Asian women. You know, here they are talking about, you know, women's rights and so forth, but here they are pulling them out of what is their retail experience. That's something that they go to and you've removed that seat in from Green Street on the grounds that, um, you know, people might accumulate there during COVID and, and be super spreaders. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, you're taking away infrastructure and you're saying to people, we're not going to listen to, uh, to you because there, you've already got a place in the city. We're going to listen to something else and something else is going to take traction. Now, what that something else is could threaten that very thing that's made that place successful. So I think all of this has an impact. I think um, health and well-being is, is an important thing for me personally. I mean, I'm a carer for a disabled parent who also has um, mental health issues. And I think um, the high street, unfortunately, has become more of an aggressive place it's not ha it hasn't got a rhythm to it that it used to have you know it used to be a much more pleasant high streets that we used to visit uh nowadays we're um you know you're up against you know buy 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 or if you want to sit somewhere it's you have to buy a coffee and sit there or buy something else to sit there and we need to look at that experience um that the shoppers experience is fully understood or the visitors experience thanks so much i'm really intrigued by your word traction because it implies that there's a kind of cultural imaginary that's either celebrated or relegated. And just as a matter of interest, when we did our careful mapping um, of Rye Lane over the past nine months, it was absolutely evident that there were as many closures and vacancies on the northern end of the street as the southern. And yet it's invariably that one end of the street is represented as dynamic and successful and the other is kind of falling away. And I'm, I'm, you know, my, my kind of favorite local high street is Peckham Rye Lane. And the vacancies on that street are consistently negligible um, compared to say Fleet Street, which I have to walk down in order to go to work and probably 80% of it's boarded up. Um, but again, you know, one street is, is regarded as being kind of comparatively robust and important for the city and the other's almost incidental. It goes back to Monda's, um, really early statements about how do we speak um, economic vitality uh, in a way that can resonate politically um, mm. as mm. well as culturally. So moving on to our very last question before we open up to the floor, because I think this is a very nice way also to open up onto the floor. And I, I'll start with you again, Saif. The last question is really about, so where do we go from here? What kinds of frameworks, energies, initiatives, um, and possibly even future policy directions um, and, and existing forms of policy are available to us to kind of fight a more assertive fight for the ethnically diverse high street future? Um, and what are the kinds of things that we want to organize that struggle around? Oh, well, I mean, it's, I think it's the million dollar question. I think all the high streets are looking for right now. And the, um, the thing about Br um, Brick Lane is uh, tied to essentially the city and the disparity of wealth that you're seeing being pushed. Um, there's huge, the bankers who, you know, didn't show their face at all during COVID. Um, it was in fact, the people who were on the street, who are my neighbors, for example, who are nurses. 
uh, my neighbors who died as well, who would, um, because they were helping out larger families or their um, wider network of families and community who need to be brought into the high street because they're the normal people who actually make a difference collectively. And I think um, there's a huge push with, um, with artists coming in and that's really been exploited I think artists need to be given the protection and respect that they deserve because in a lot of cases what's happened is gentrification has followed them unfortunately and it's not something 99% of artists particularly want um, and they've been used in that process and there's no way for them to actually say um, for example can we go back to Brook Lane instead they've been and they have become visitors to that now, you know, because it's become so commercialized and commodified. So I think um, we need to look at it in terms of different scales, firstly, because um, the short term, medium term and long term ways in looking at different systems and the impact of that. And the first thing we should be doing is looking at where the wealth is. Now, if new wealth has come in through um, large scale development, through tall building strategies, through developers who are making millions, if not a billion, maybe in some cases, um, then we need to look at how that comes to people and whether that has an impact and whether politicians are tied to this model or they need to break out of that, then, or maybe we should do save the politicians, which might be a good campaign to do. But what we need to do is we need to look at these um, the, the schisms within the system that are not helping small businesses or micro businesses and the people who have put them there because at the moment they've been ignored. Um, in Newham, there's a, um, there's a trial happening which is called co-design and co-production and which is a bit, it turned out to be a bit of a mess really at the moment because what it's, what it's done is it's, it's created a, a, a digital divide between people who can access forums online and people who don't or traditionally haven't. So unfortunately they've been become digitally excluded, which is not fair. And also um, we need to really look at who's holding our data, which becomes an ethical issue because a lot of high streets now, um, because of, I mean, people are talking about shopping on Amazon and eBay and so forth. In fact, they're not being taxed properly. So these companies which are online are destroying our high streets. So I think they need to be taxed properly or they need to come onto the high street in a much more nuanced way to say, well, hang on a minute, we are part of what you do locally. And that needs to be looked at as well. And where is our data going? You know, we need to um, we need to be able to have access to that. And local businesses and small businesses need to we need to break through a lot of these barriers, um, which the data holders aren't really sharing with us. Whether it's be the council or the chambers of commerce or whoever it is that's holding the um, data, which is really shifting our high street um, at the moment. If I'm honest with you, Green Street is actually, for example, a very successful high street, but Clane is a very successful lane, and that's because of local people. And I'm really hopeful that as long as we keep focusing on that, that that is a sustainable part of a local economy that's self-sustaining. And I think that is what we should all push for. Um, I don't think Amazon and eBay really need our money. I mean, they made however many billion while maybe, you know, millions died. Um, and I think we need to put that into perspective. Thanks, Saif. Fatima, on to you. I mean, of course, you are free to answer the question in any which way you choose, but I would also love to hear your thoughts on people's power and organizing capacities. Um, I mean, the question you posed, it, it really is a, you know, million dollar question, but um, I think one of the things we did at the campaign, we just recognized immediately that we have to basically organize um, and, and put up a fight because the way councils work, and particularly Tower Hamlet's council, is that um, they tend to be very, uh, you know, they have a very jolly relationship with developers. But in this instance, on Brick Lane in particular, the Zulu family who own the Truman Brewery site, they're not your, if you want to say corporate style developers, because they're, they're, they're a local family, right? Or they've, they've had that property or th that site for something like 30, 30 odd years now, 35 years. So, um, so I think also to consider how wealth is accumulated because a lot of Spitterfields, uh, the area Spitterfields of Bangna Town is owned by the Truman Brewery or by the Zulu family. So I think we've got to also consider how, you know, um, you know, if we really want to look at the sort of uh, wealth disparity, a sort of wealth, uh, you know, redistribution and how that can happen, how one family comes to then dominate and have sort of hegemony over a whole area. And they can then essentially inform 
how things turn out with the with their land without locals getting to have a say because one of the things we one of the things that we got from the other uh, side uh, other than you know constantly calling us nimbies um they kept saying you know oh but we have to abide by planning application rules and regulations and legislations and you know the the, the zulu family submitted the application you know we deferred it because they didn't meet this particular requirement so we pushed for this and um it's just quite astounding how you have local elected politicians councillors who sit on these planning um application sort of meetings and they get to decide um but the constant claim by uh, particular and i will name them particularly uh, councillor kevin brady that um actually their job is just to see if they've met the legal requirements or not and that's it but in that case you know our sort of argument then is then why is it not local why is it not lawyers then who are on this meeting why is it local councillors you know why is it that you know, so I think I think you know not only just critiquing the sort of planning um, system, but also how you know um, the council has almost washed its hands off the local community because not and we see that for example in education. So I was a secondary school teacher before I entered academia, and just little things of how services within a secondary school are outsourced. So I was I was in a school um, in Tower Hamlets, which became an academy. And now they're a part of a different trust, then they became part of another trust. And what that means is, um, and while I was at this school, we had a one week event where we had to organize a Shakespeare performance in multiple different languages, because we were uh, being visited by a bunch of businessmen from Canary Wharf to basically get fat checks from them, because academies have the freedom to do that, because you're not really held accountable, you know, to the, you, you're, not, you're not held accountable to the council, right? Um, so when I saw all of that in this particular school in Tower Hamlets, um, and then also other academies that I've worked in, you know, and how the council pretty much just says, you know, schools are free to do what they want once they're academies, you know, and then we see that, you know, sort of uh, this uh, trickle down effect in other sectors. And we see that, for example, with the way uh, decisions are made in, in, in planning uh, meetings with regards to vast amounts of land. And, um, and how, you know, uh, those uh, families and this one family in particular want to do, uh, you know, the, the build the shopping mall with the, all these sort of luxury brands and uh, restaurants and cafes. And, and, and you can't even bring in the fact that actually this will not benefit the local community. Um, and what's interesting about Brick Lane as well is how the Truman Brewery is, is, is becomes a core site where you see that sort of racial divide as well. Right, because the south end, that's where you have the curry houses and you see all the Bangladeshi uncles who are standing outside with their workers trying to entice, you know, local, uh, sorry, um, uh, walkers, uh, people walking by, you know, like, do you want to come and have a curry? And then you sort of walk past the Truman Brewery and it's a completely different energy even, you know, like the, 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 the vibe, the atmosphere, the kind of food that's being sold there. Um, so I think to answer your question, it's, you know, you really have to organise on the ground local people and one of the things we decided to do as part of our campaign is we can't just because we recognize immediately that there's a digital divide in town hamlets that a lot of uh, Bangladeshi families didn't even have laptops when their kids weren't able to go to school. So there was a scheme to make sure every child had a laptop. So because we recognize this gap immediately, we thought, OK, we can't just get a an online petition and just sort of, uh, you know, spread that on WhatsApp. So we decided to map out all the key estates around Brick Lane. So from the north to the south end, we mapped out all the key estates around Brick Lane. And we said, OK, um, we're going to divide up into pairs. And at least one of the uh, individuals within the pair has to speak Bengali. And, um, and we did this. We went onto all the estates, knocked on people's doors. So the 550 signatures we collected were of actual humans who signed our letter that we took to them. And we stood at their doorway and, and spoke to them on the estates. and. In my case, I was invited into some families' homes, into their living rooms, because they were baffled by this, this, this new development. So, you, you, you know, you'd really have to start a very grassroots movement of speaking to the people, um, you know, and, and speaking to the people, what is happening, and to the traders. And we did speak to the traders, and, and the initial deferral that happened in April for this planning application was because we got 90 signatures from, the, from traders on Brick Lane, from north to south. So we showcase that actually this will impact various businesses because no one wants to pay higher rents. Why would they want to pay higher rents? You know, so we went up and down Brick Lane, collected those signatures. So, you know, so, so to give, I guess, a simple uh, response to your question is, 
get local people organized organize uh, local people a petition isn't sufficient it's yeah. not going to do anything so um you know getting out there onto you know the, the street mapping things out working with different organizations and people and communities and, and, and bring them together and and when you kick up a fuss that's when they listen and i think because we're say brick lane we you know, uh, had our three rallies. And I think that's when Tahamat's council realized, you know, and plus we managed to get a lot of local councillors on board. We've got Rushnara Ali on board, we've got Afsana Begum on board. So when they started recognizing that actually our local politicians are supporting them, our local MPs are supporting them, that's when people, the Tahamat's council got scared of us, scared of our campaign, of what we are capable of doing. Um, so I think, I think building up that power with the people from, uh, from the estates, um, you know, and that's when when you can shake things up. Otherwise, councils aren't, aren't there to look out for local communities. Thanks, Fatima. So, Manda, over to you. I know that you bring in very particular expertise and and and, uh, and a wider set of geographies. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit to different decision making processes and vehicles, potential policy avenues and resourcing avenues and possibly even thinking about the deviation of, of rates away from central government into kind of more locally constituted forms. Yeah, sure. I can, in, in terms of potential responses, I mean, we've, we've uh, I think between us, we've painted um, a real um, rich picture of the sort of real structural obstacles for these streets and the fact that, you know, that, there are really existential challenges now and perhaps even more in a more acute form in the future as well. At the same time, what Fatima has done has highlighted that, that there are avenues for resistance and for an, an alternative, and for the, the positing of a more optimistic alternative. And, uh, and I, I, I certainly think that's the case. I'd just sort of highlight two or three potential ways of responding. But one is just to emphasize Fatima's point about local mobilization. The only thing I would add, I would agree with everything Fatima said. It, uh, drawing on the experience we've had on this sort of six, seven year project with Citizens UK, it, it has to be though uh, over and beyond just episodic um, actions over a discrete issue. It has to be relational, long term, um, and there has to be an investment in personal time and uh, personal commitment. One of the, in, in all the geographies that we've talked about, I think we would we, all agree that there's a, a level of disenchantment amongst people inhabiting those streets and those areas of people coming in and then leaving after they've got what they want. Academics extract the data and then leave. Policymakers consult on regeneration and then, uh, then depart. And I think, you know, when we started off our first listening campaign in Citizens UK in 2015 and our first meeting with employees, there's a huge level of animosity and antagonism um, because of the, 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 the thing was, what are you selling? What are you wanting? You know, uh, and, and when are you going? Um, and that was the tenor of the debate. Uh, and and um, I think that's a real, uh, I think, as Susie, you've written about, you know, th these are real ethical choices. What do you do? You know, as, as academics, what do you do? Um, and I think there are real decisions to be made. A lot of our universities now talk about being engaged in institutions, community institutions, anchor institutions. You know, if that has any substance at all, it means it has to mean showing up for these communities, not only, you know, to put them on a glossy brochure, but to invest on a, a daily basis. So community organizing is a habit. So I think, and, and that's what, we, we have tried to do in our very micro way in our project. And I think that has value because I think now, you know, we, we are part now, we are part of the ecosystem of those business owners. They will turn to us. It's quite natural for them to speak to us in a way that would have been unnatural before. Um, and I think uh, that wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for that investment in time. You know, without the prospect of a, a, a grant or a paper, you know, it really, it's just there for the relationship building that relationship. I think that's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and I think the value of that is, um, you know, that, that's where I suppose the academic, I suppose, competencies, come to, skills come to play because 
you know, intuitively, we know these are incredibly valuable businesses, incredibly valuable um, places and spaces and relationships in their own right. But unless they're codified in a language that can persuade policymakers, they don't have a chance of entering the policy realm. And so, you know, um, we will use these experiences to say, well, they're creating next market jobs, but they're also um, ensuring that the business support you provide now is getting to these communities, right? And and I, and I think that you can start beginning assembling the material you need to make a case that um, holds sway amongst policymakers. So I think organising and using that process of organising is a way to do it. The second, um, there's a lot of pressure. This is probably in the wake of um, uh, George Floyd more than anything else, but there's a lot of pressure on public sector and the public sector institutions um, to be, be more receptive to diversity. And that is including, including uh, business support as well. And that provides a space as well to say, look, if you do want to realize this ambition, if you do want to be inclusive, you've got to change the way you look and evaluate businesses. And this is a way to do it. I think the short answer is if we find ways of making it easier for policymakers to understand what they're missing out, that's really, really uh, important. And I think the third is, um, as I alluded to right at the start, and now I think, it's certainly in our area, they, they are talking about inclusive growth. And there are very few templates, I mean, policymakers, they are talking about inclusive growth. There are very few templates that sort of substantiate what it actually means. And there are even fewer type of templates that sort of highlight or explain what levelling up means. But I think you can make a case, um, Susie, you know, you can draw on your research, research we've done that sort of highlights that. Uh, Multinational businesses uh, are more likely to be innovative, more likely to trade overseas, more likely to grow. Well, those are precisely the qualities you need to build back better, if, if that has any meaning at all. So I think all of those factors combined together um, provide an opportunity to sort of develop a competing narrative to the one that policymakers are, are usually informed by. But you know, making that case has to be, we, we have to be unrelenting and, make, and innovative and, and, creative, and creative in making that case at every, at every possible policy jurisdiction at a very, very local level to your growth hubs, to your local enterprise partnerships, to local authorities, that really th this is an alternative way of realising the objectives that you say that you're committed to. Thank you, Manda. So three really important um, and, and, and intersecting ways of articulating possible ways forward. We would love to open up to those of you who would like to engage with us. Um, the chat is open, but also there's probably um, a, a small enough number that if you would like to come in um, freely, please feel that you can do so. Um, anyone who would like to start with a question. I know, Connor Kuzak, that you put in the chat the variable rate of the, the delivery um, extractions. Um, if you'd like to detail some of that for us, that could also be interesting. But if anyone would like to come in, um, people from the lane, people from other streets, that would be great. Very quiet out there, and I can only see the four of us, the five of us on the screen. Equally, we're very oh, I happy. Think Connor's got his hand up. Oh, Connor. So I'm sorry, I can't see hands at the moment. Um, one attendee, and I can't see who it is. If it is Connor, and if Fatima can see that it's Connor, please feel free to come in. We would love to hear from you. Rohini, I'm not too sure how I get Connor to come in. Perhaps you can help me. Is there a way, Rohini, of, of um, unmuting Connor? 
I'm so sorry, my internet is really unstable, so I'm only getting half of what everybody's saying. Um, what was the question, sorry? There's someone from the floor who would like to come in, but we don't know how to unmute that person. I think they'll have to write it in the in the chat or in the Q&A because it's a webinar, not a not Okay, open. sorry, sorry. Um, Connick, would you be able to type your question into the chat? Your question or your response? Thank you. Real typing pressure there. Okay, so Connor says a really interesting discussion. We're really keen at Islington Council to protect our ethnically diverse high streets such as Finsbury Park. And I'm interested to know how important the panelists think sector types are. So Connor, is that really, uh, I guess that is a question around um, relationships uh, between different kinds of retail, food, clothing, service sector. Um, but also of course, you know, high streets are not just constructed by those, those retail concerns they're also constructed by things like libraries schools etc so i mean for me to just jump in there i would say that in the first instance is, is some of those public assets that are absolutely elemental uh, the role of a primary school on a street the role of a library the role of a mosque the role of a church these are kind of elemental resources for the day-to-day -day life of communities i don't know if any of you on our panel would explicitly like to come in um, and think about retail and the difference explicitly in this case between um, independent retail and chains. Monda, you're probably quite sharp on that one. Well, I, 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 I didn't know your point about institutions like libraries, faith institutions being really fundamental. But I mean, Connor put in the chat um, sectors, but I think your work, Sujin, and, and, and our own highlighted how difficult it is to categorize, uh, categorize firms according to sectors. Uh, Susie has written about um, businesses that you think, uh, we certainly found this to be the case, businesses that you think are groceries and shouldn't suddenly the internet cafes, so then, then they be developed into barber shops, then they develop into travel agents, and they're all in the same space. Um, and, uh, you know, what I think it, I think it'd be very difficult, uh, especially uh, to, to have a top-down approach to understanding sectors in these places. They're very organic living uh, entities, and um, they're multi multi-stranded, and they continually evolve. And so, I think the unit of analysis would have to be a, a little different. No safe is itching uh, to come in as well on that point. So we've got a comment. Oh, sorry, Saif, please go ahead. And then we've got a, a comment from Claire Alexander after that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I mean I've been to Islington. I mean, I'm into um, Finsley Park a few times. I think the um, the concern here is is the rate of development, really. And um, essentially, where we as individuals, if we're very honest to ourselves, how we position ourselves within that. And actually, positionality is really important increasingly that with ourselves, with our, whether it's upwardly mobile middle class aspirations or whatever it is we personally want to um, engage with and we don't realise whether we're consciously or unconsciously pushing that as we walk through the high street and there's an impact to that and that's something that we have to all be aware of like I 10 years ago had to shift the way I shop because I was finding I was going to supermarkets and most of the food I came back with 
was bad in a couple of weeks and blah 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 and I wasn't particularly learning anything it was stupidly expensive or I could spend money on something else but um, what you find is similarly in in that high street is that um, you probably find that the rate of developments there in fact you probably find architects have moved into your area um, and usually that tends to mean um, that gentrification is on its way um, so I think the big thing for um, for Islington and areas of, of growth um, is to look at can gentrification be managed? Uh, how can we add a quality of life for the existing people? And can that quality of life continue for multiple generations is something that needs to be looked at in a very nuanced and sensitive way. And that has to be brought into the um, detail into local plans and policies that the council have to co-produce with local people and i think that genuinely has to take place it's not just a case of tick boxing and um, um samosa eating parties or whatever it is um it has to be quite genuine thanks Saif. we have a question from claire alexander she would be interested to hear about uh, what you think the panelists about generational differences amongst bame communities in terms of how they view the small businesses and restaurant sectors. And of course, um, Fatima, if you want to come in and, and reflect on responses from the lane, that would be great too. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I just feel like for the purposes of this conversation, perhaps I should clarify that I don't research high streets. Um, I, I'm, I'm involved in this uh, campaign within the capacity of being one of the co-founders and members of an organizing group um, for Bangladeshis and by Bangladeshis. Um, so I'm not on the Save Brooklyn campaign as an academic per se, and it's not something I'd be writing about in an academic capacity. Um, and um, I'm also conscious of various academics who have gotten in touch to write about it. So uh, there's uh, plenty to say about that. Uh, maybe that would be a separate seminar or webinar. Um, and, and, and how talking about extraction and, and how uh, how academics are, are actually in the process of trying to extract from this campaign. Um, but to answer the question, I think one of the issues we found was, um, well, one of the things I came across was I, I have become rather weirdly, um, have developed this really, um, uh, you know, very, um, I'm not sure how to describe it, but just very nice relationship with this one uncle uh, in a restaurant on Brick Lane, who is completely against our campaign, completely against it. Like he would never support us. But every time he sees me, he's just incredibly warm and offers me food and everything. And, and we've had numerous conversations. Uh, this uncle and I have sat in his restaurant and he's always sort of uh, very excited about his new menu so he showed me his new menu he wants to change he showed me the other restaurant uh, two doors down that he's bought recently he's trying to turn it into a uh, more um, uh, so that restaurant he's building right now he doesn't want to serve alcohol in that restaurant but he's very conscious of the fact that in his current restaurant most of his profits come from alcohol and what's really interesting is his new restaurant, he's thinking about the new generation of Bangladeshis who do live in multi-generational households across Tower Hamlets, who have developed um, an interest in eating their own home food outside, because that was, that was quite an unusual uh, practice, if you want to say, for a lot of, um, comfortably, I would say, for a lot of South Asians to eat your own home food outside. Um, and I think that's becoming more and more common, sort of street food, eating of like, samosa charts, you know, chana charts, um, you know, pani puris. It's become quite very popular that people go out to restaurants who serve this as form of tapas style. Um, so Dishoom was obviously is the, one of the biggest restaurants in the market who does this now. And a lot of people go and eat these sort of finger food. And this uncle said to me, you know, I want to tap into this generation because I know they have, you know, a disposable income. And I'm considering opening up a potential on the rooftop. Um, and he took me to the rooftop and said to me, you know, I potentially want to consider opening up a shisha cafe on the rooftop, but I need to um, apply for the license for that. But uh, downstairs, I want it to be sort of finger food. So people have, you know, different dishes that they sit together and, and drink, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not going to have alcohol the, on the premises. So the generational, just to answer your um, uh, question here, um, uh, is that, you know, I think just this, from this one conversation, it seems like uh, the uncles, because he's quite a significant figure in the Restaurant Association of Brick Lane as well, this particular uncle. Um, uh, and maybe maybe those of you who have worked on Brick Lane may not even know him. His name's Shamsuddin, who runs Monsoon Restaurant. Um, 
And he was just saying, yeah, like I'm recognizing and a lot of us actually on this lane are recognizing that there are a lot of young Bengalis who have disposable income. So that's a, that's a niche market we need to start, tap, you know, start tapping into because, because those young Bangladeshis in Tower Hamlets are going to places like Jishun because there is one on Brick Lane, uh, uh, not Brick Lane, sorry, um, just by Shoreditch. Um, so I think there's this recognition of sort of young people are willing to go out and the whole experience of dining with friends and, and colleagues and having alternative South Asian food, no longer the korma and the vindaloos, but about, you know, more authentic uh, food um, with their friends, with their colleagues. And um, however, when I think about the fruit and vegetable shops, I don't see personally from the numerous weekends that we were canvassing and door knocking. I don't think I ever saw a young Bengali in, in those fruit and veg shops. It, it, it was usually them popping in for a relative because a relative told them, go and pick up this and this. But um, so I think this sort of experience of cooking itself is, is, is being reshaped within a lot of Bangladeshi households uh, of, of because a lot of uh, younger uh, women also are, are in the in in, in um, are working, so it's no longer the sort of traditional gender setup of you know the mother giving instructions or going herself to buy the food. Um, so I think the dynamic of shopping of for fruit and veg is changing. Um, but with regards to the curry industry, I would say that a lot of the uncles who own these restaurants are, are very uh, acutely aware of um, this niche market that's emerging and something that they're trying to tap into. And another thing I noticed from, from April till about August when we were canvassing, I was on Brick Lane pretty much every weekend. Every weekend we were canvassing and I picked up, there was this restaurant, I don't know if you remember the name site, the one by Hopetown Street, there was a restaurant there that's now been, and the owners are Bengali, but it's now a Thai restaurant that is being run by Bangladeshis. And, and again, recognizing that, for example, East Asian cuisine has become very popular because on Commercial Street alone, there's a lot of uh, Korean places. There's one Japanese place that sadly closed down, but that was run by Bangladeshis who had lived in Japan, who were chefs in Japan, and they had opened that, but that's closed down now. Um, and sort of this recognition that sort of particularly Korean cuisine because of sort of K-dramas and sort of popularity of sort of uh, South Korean food and noticing that actually, you know, East Asian cuisine is becoming popular. So I think... Um, yeah, I feel like maybe I've gone off on a tangent or maybe I have answered your question. Please do let me know. But um, yeah, I feel like a lot of uncles are aware so much so that they're serving completely new cuisines in buildings that were traditionally or, or just a few years ago, a few months ago, were Bangladeshi restaurants. So I think I think a lot of people are definitely aware of the dynamics and people's um, awareness of different South Asian cuisines, you know, because uh, regional food is very popular now, you know, like South Indian food has become very popular in the last few years of eating dosas and um, of eating um, uh, of eating uh, uh, like kotus, uh, you know, very popular street food in, in, in South India and Sri Lanka. So I think a lot of people are just becoming, the palate is basically diversifying. And I think those uncles are trying to keep up with this, this changing palate. Thank you. I'm, I'm aware that we are um, half past three on the dot. Um, I would like to give our panelists, if they would like a last word, you are very welcome to claim a last word. Um, would any of you like to say anything before we close? Zaid? I'd, I'd like to just make a point that, um, that artists in particular at, at the moment there's some real big issues for, for artists in particular at the moment there's some very big issues about brain draining artists for ideas um, art washing on the high street and so forth which is a real issue because rather than dealing with heritage and arts in a more cohesive sensitive um, embedded way what's happening is again the top-down model and response to art and culture is something that certainly comes up for me on the high street it's something that i'm going to raise for the next two years maybe just because that's what i'm experiencing um, and it's something that we need to find criticality for because as a result what's happening is the high street's becoming a bit of a culture war now um, for various communities but um, but at the same time there's culture fighters like ourselves so so that's very nice to hear and be part of. And thank you very much, everyone. I'm so grateful to you, Fatima, Asaif and Wanda for making this conversation today. And thank you also to our participants. Um, we hope that you find 
some of the reports useful. We hope that you, in your different capacities, are able to join the various and important campaigns um, around all of this. And yeah, thank you. And thank you, Rohini, again, and Matt, for organizing this for us. Thank you. Thank you, Rohini. Thank you. Thank you, Rohini, for having me. Thank you all so much for your time. It's been a really interesting, valuable discussion, um, which yeah, has opened up space for so much more. So yeah, thank you um, to all our panelists and particular thanks to Susie for oh, sharing so today. So um, and yeah, we look forward to the next one. Great. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.